and what we're a part of. And so uh, I want to first actually start by bringing greetings from my wife, Carla. And so my wife, Carla, she's a worship and creative arts pastor um, in Barrie, Ontario. Actually, to be honest with you, she's away this weekend and she's out visiting her parents in uh, British Columbia. And so she's at her brother's church, or, or my brother-in-law is a pastor. And so they're at Coquitlam today. And, and so just chatting with her last night uh, there in BC and she's, it's warm but rainy there. And uh, she's having a great time visiting her folks, uh, kind of the first time since the pandemic that she's been able to get out there and see them. So. Uh, it's it's uh, it's nice that way. And um, my son Caleb, he's uh, he's in Calgary at university out there and studying. He feels called to be a missionary doctor someday. Yeah. And so he's a biomedical uh, uh, health studies uh, student and just on route there. And then uh, my daughter Grace is just finishing up her final year at Western here in London. And so she's uh, going through on her masters and. And so just applying for that and trying to figure out the world that she's going to be in. And so uh, I'm actually going to see her this afternoon for a few minutes on road. I got a service in Niagara Falls tonight, but I'll uh, drop in and see her on my way through. Uh, so bring greetings from my family and, and blessings on you. Just uh, so you're aware, you're part of a bigger family. And so this church is part of the, the Pentecostal family. And so uh, the PAOC, if you will. And so the PAOC... Uh, we're an organization, a, a fellowship of churches, so we resist against calling ourselves a denomination, but we're a fellowship of churches, and so it's a cooperative, voluntary fellowship of churches, so across Canada, some 1,200 or so churches across Canada, and that's divided into eight different districts just for uh, care over the churches, and so you're part of Western Ontario District. And so in Western Ontario District, we have around 340-ish churches in Western Ontario District. And uh, my role is what they call the superintendent. So I serve as the pastor of the pastors, if you will. So uh, I would be the one who cares for and serves our pastors. In Western Ontario, we have roughly uh, 1,200 pastors or so that I would... Uh, get the opportunity and, and blessing to be able to serve and uh, to care for. So Pastor Steve is one of those pastors and, and I have a special spot in my heart for all of those who are uh, the, the co-vocational pastors. A number of our churches, our churches range in size from, uh, from, from small uh, little churches. Some of our churches in the north are, are just hamlets of people. It's great. Uh, all the way up to large, large churches with 60 pastors on staff and, and uh, you know, big, big organizational uh, kind of churches. And so in everything in between. And that's what makes it such a beautiful Amen. fellowship of churches. Uh, just to give you an idea, we have, uh, we have churches, a number of our churches are culturally based. And so uh, last week I was in a Filipino church and just a great time together uh, with our Filipino friends. I used to actually pastor a Filipino church years ago. So for me, it was like coming home in some ways and, and a lot of fun. We have everything from uh, Southeast Asian, different uh, dialects. We have uh, Egyptian, Russian, uh, I know that it, it, just everything in between, everything you can imagine. I was in a Korean church a couple of weeks ago. I was in a, uh, uh, in a Swahili African church a few weeks ago after that. So just a little bit of everything. We're a church planting movement. And so when we're at our best, we came together as, a, as an association of churches because we felt we could do international missions better together and that we could uh, plant churches better. And so uh, just exciting. Last Sunday, we had uh, the first ever Sunday for a new church in London. It's called the Table International Church, and it's serving Fanshawe students specifically. Wow. And, and so it was kind of cool just to have that launch last week of that church. And, and uh, we uh, last year we had uh, seven new churches get started. And so it's so exciting to be there on their first ever Sunday at a church and see God begin to do yeah. great things. And so if someone would say, hey, the church in Canada is dying, I, I just believe the opposite of that. There, are, there is pockets, and we know that there's there's challenge, but I see the church moving forward. Um, over the last five years, we've seen 50 new churches started uh, in Western Ontario District. And yeah, it's, it's exciting to see 
things move forward and see God doing incredible uh, things. As I was considering what to share with you this morning and, and kind of what to speak on a little bit as we enter into a new year and, and, and as we walk in this, a lot of people would say uh, society or um, those in, in uh, mental health and so on and so forth, they would say, sociologists, that's the word I was looking for, would say that last week was the most depressing week of the year. So if you look at studies, they would say, okay, it's still kind of lots of darkness in the in Western or in Northern Hemisphere. Um, lots of darkness. You've just come through Christmas and you've got your credit card bills from Christmas and the overwhelmingness of that is cold, although it wasn't too bad. But they would say it's a tough time of year. And so I was thinking about that and, and thinking, okay, it only gets better from here now for the rest of the year. And, and that God actually has some incredible things in store. One of the things when I was in high school, which was uh, a few years ago now, uh, <laughs> decades and decades, and, uh, but, but um, I would, in elementary school and high school, I would always get into whatever uh, you could do to... Um, get out of class. And so whatever there was that was going on that you could like miss school for, I was game for that. So every sporting event that you could, I was a part of like the soccer team and the rugby team. And, and then I found out that badminton, you could actually miss an entire week in this special camp for badminton. I was like, badminton is my new favorite sport. So I worked really hard to win the championship so that I could get out of school. And so it was like motivation, cross country, uh, and you just name it. I would get a part of it, and you, did, you know, if you could miss class, I would, I would work hard to shine in that to get out of class. I don't know if my motivations were so good, but <laughs> so I found out along the way that actually the chess team you could miss significant time of class, and I was like, chess team? I don't know. The other ones, sports are kind of fun, but chess team, and so, but then I'm like. Mm, it happens during the winter when it was kind of cold just like there. And you could go away once again for a three-day tournament for chess. And I was like, okay. I had to get good enough to beat my classmates. And, and so I worked really hard. And so anyone here ever played chess before? So I got a little, my, I asked my wife actually. She's afraid of arts and worship. And I said, hey, babe, Jim, uh, I'm thinking about preaching. I'm making a move. And she's like, oh, I have some chess pieces that I made. And I was like, Sweet. And so, so I swiped these from my wife the other day. And, 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 but chess is all about making not just one move, but thinking ahead to yeah. the moves ahead. And so you make one move, but, but you're really making that move with, with a move two or three times down the way in mind. And you're, you're, you're saying, okay, I've got, I've got a move. And, and you're kind of on the clock. Like that clock's ticking and you've got to make a move. In life, some of us, the clock's ticking a little bit. Right? And I believe God's calling us to make some moves and God's calling us to step out, to trust Him oh, yeah. and see what He has in store for us. But we, we, we have to take that step. We have to make that move and say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you yes, with my future. Amen. I'm going to trust you with what's ahead in my life. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the book of Judges. And I'm going to go through kind of a, uh, a big story. I'm not going to read three chapters because, well, we'll be here until Pastor Steve's back from holidays. But uh, so I, I thought we would go and just kind of do a quick little bit of an overview. Judges chapter 6 and through 7 and 8. And we read the story of a guy named Gideon. Now, just to put context to this whole story, what's going on is the people of Israel find themselves in these loops. And it's kind of a downturn loop, just like our society right now. We're in this like, hmm, this is a tough time of year. Likewise, they would have these seasons that are kind of loops. They, they would go through these moments when they would trust God and they would surrender their lives to God and God would do incredible things and everything would go amazing. And then as soon as things started to go amazing, they kind of thought it was their own doing and they would like forget about God and they would uh, quit relying on the Lord and then... They would turn from God, and then things would not go so amazing, and they would find themselves in trouble, and this loop happened. Do you ever see those loops in your own life along the way? 
And here's this one of these loops where they, they've been following the things of God, but, but things have got off track and, and they, 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 they turned their back on the Lord and, and they were delivered into the Midianites' hands. And this warring neighboring tribe, every time that they would, there was good things happening, the Midianites would just come and steal and pillage. And this, this cycle had happened a number of times. And you can imagine... How it said that they were they were deeply oppressed, and every time they felt like they were getting ahead, it was like, you ever feel like that in life? It's like every time you feel like you're getting ahead, just and so every time that they would take a harvest, the Midianites would come and just pillage. And so we pick this story up here, where where it says, here's Gideon, and he's threshing wheat in a wine press. Now I don't know how many of you come from any agricultural background. Uh, I grew up on a bit of a farm, and and but we didn't we didn't thresh wheat out in the open. We had like a combine for that, and and uh, and to make that happen. But but in this day and age, you would take the wheat in the most airy place possible. So you'd get out in the windiest spot, and you'd throw it up in the air, and and the heavy wheat would fall, and the chaff would blow away. So to do it in a wine press, in other words, hidden like that, is kind of the opposite of how you should thresh wheat. But he was doing that because he was afraid because the, the Midianites were, were, were there to come and just rob, steal, pillage, and take away the harvest. So you get this picture. Here's this guy who's so afraid. He's, he's, he's had traumatic experiences. He's had them come and do this to his family and, and destroy. Here he is with his livelihood and, and the food for the next season. And he's so careful. He's so afraid. And he's in this wine press trying to thresh wheat. And I love it says that the angel of the Lord shows up under the oak tree. In other words, the Lord shows up. And in a gentle way, oh, thank you so much. In a gentle way, the Lord, I love it, the Lord's not like this. Right? But instead, the Lord just, you just get this image. There he is under the oak tree. Amen. And he speaks to Gideon and he says, Gideon, mighty warrior, and this would seem so crazy. Mighty warrior? Like Gideon is the opposite. He's a frady cat in a, in a wine press. He's, he's like panic attack. And there the Lord speaks to him and says, mighty warrior. It's almost like the Lord's making fun of him, but it's not that at all. The Lord sees him as what he could be yeah. rather than what he is right now. And I would say that's what the Lord sees you. Yeah. Not just as what you are right now, but what you can be in him. Yeah. And he says, mighty warrior. And he says, the Lord's going to be with you. And Gideon's like, no, Lord, like, I am so weak. He comes back with an inferiority complex. He says, I am actually the weakest of my family. I'm the youngest of four kids. And, and so in that culture, like, you know, the youngest is kind of the, gets the hard time. I would say I got the hard time. My siblings would say I had the easy time. But whatever, I don't know. How many youngest kids are there in their house? So you had the hard time? Uh, I know you're paying. No. <laughs> How many oldest kids are in the house? You were the mean ones, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. No. So, so here it is. So here he says, I'm the weakest of my family. And then not just that, I'm the weakest of the tribe. Mm -hmm. And our tribe is the weakest tribe in all the tribes. Yeah. Won't, won't, won't. Yeah. Here he is saying, like, I have, I have no business. Lord, you're calling me a mighty warrior. I am literally the last person in all of Israel that should be chosen for this. If you put it in our context, you would be like the weakest person in all of camp. And the Lord says, no, no, I see you as a mighty warrior. Yes, Lord. I, I, I have a trust in you. And he speaks to him to go out and to make a move to trust him and say, okay, Gideon, even though you're in this predicament, even though it's difficult, even though it's hard, trust me. Yeah. And then Gideon does exactly what, and he goes with a little bit of fear. He, he, he goes out at first thing, he goes out at night and he takes down what's the Asherah poles, which was the, the foreign gods worship. He takes it down at night. He doesn't do it during the day because he's afraid. But the Lord's with him. Yes. And he starts to see some success. He, he, he questions the Lord. He, puts the, he does 
it, it kind of weird moments. I would encourage you to read through this this week. He, he puts a, a fleece out and he says, okay, Lord, just kind of this bonkers request to God. He's like, okay, put water on the fleece and dry ground around if this is really you. And then the Lord does it. And then, okay, I want you to flip flop that and do opposite. And then the Lord is like gracious with him and does it again. And he yeah. sees, okay, God's with me here. And so then it goes, and, and he starts gathering troops, and, and it's like, okay, whoa. And he, he begins to blow his horn, which was a sign of, like, coming together in that day. And before you know it, they have 30,000 troops with them, ready to defeat these oppressors that had been going on. Now, they meet the oppressors, and the oppressors, the Midianites, have 130,000 people. Think about that, 30,000 to 130,000. It's like, you know, it, it's got to be a miracle if they're going to win. And they're sitting there, they're afraid. And then the Lord speaks to him and says, okay, Gideon, you have too many men. And Gideon's like, what? Like, I got 30,000 versus 130,000. Lord, seriously. And the Lord's like, you have too many men. Ask anyone that's afraid to raise their hand. And so he's like, okay, anyone afraid? And a bunch of them are like, no doubt. They're like, yeah, I'm afraid. He's like, okay, you go home. And 20,000 of them leave. Yes. And now it's like, okay, now I've got 10,000 versus 130,000. And I've got 10,000 farmers versus 130,000 soldiers. Lord, what are we going to do? And the Lord's like, still too many. And he's like, what? <laughs> and so then the Lord takes him on. The Lord does some interesting things yeah. sometimes. He takes us on weird paths sometimes. And so he makes another move. And he goes down to the brook and he says, okay, Whoever drinks in a certain way, in other words, whoever gets their face down in there versus lap up, we're going we're gonna to let them go. And, and before you know it, there's a, he's left with 300 yes, yes. guys. 300 versus 130,000 of the best soldiers in the whole world at this time. Jesus. And he's sitting there and he's afraid. He's like, Lord, what have I got into? Remember, he's the guy just a few scenes earlier in the wine press, so afraid of these people. 300 versus 130,000. And the Lord speaks and says, Gideon, if you're afraid, I want you to go down, sneak down to the tent. So that's fearful in itself. And in the middle of the night, he sneaks down. And as he goes down, he listens, and he overhears, he eavesdrops, and he hears the sound of the soldiers talking. And the soldiers say, I had, I had a vision, this is the Midianite soldiers, he said, I had a vision that this barley loaf, now you got to understand in that culture, so this is a weird analogy, but barley loaves were like what the poorest of the poor ate. So you basically would feed that to animals, like barley was the... It was the, the crappy bread. And he said, I had this vision that a barley ro loaf rolled down the hill and toppled our entire yes. tent. Jeez. And the guy listening to him said, that's a vision from God. That means the people of Israel that, that, are, that are with Gideon yes. are going to destroy us. And, and we're, we're afraid. And Gideon heard that. And he's like, okay, Lord, you're with me. Yes. And so he goes out in the middle of the night and he gets the 300 soldiers and he says, okay, 300 guys, <coughs> we are going to go down. And so he, he says, get a torch and a canister and, and, and a trumpet in one hand, like no, no weapons with them. And, and so that's just crazy in itself. Like they're going into battle with no weapons. And he says, okay, make noise and then release the torches when I tell you and blow your trumpets. And the other, other army thinks that it's many, many thousands and thousands of people. And so they... They actually turn on one another. It's this crazy story. And God gives them victory. Yes. So what am I trying to say in this whole story? Saying that God's calling us to make a move. Yes, Lord. Listen to what scripture says. Um, and sorry, I took a little while going through that uh, story with you. But listen to what it says in John 15, 16. It says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to bear much fruit. Oh, yes. Turn to the person beside you and say, much fruit. <laughs> much fruit. That God actually has a plan for every single one of our lives. Yes. That he's appointed us to do something significant yes. with our lives. Yes. That he has an appointment for us to do something. Ephesians 4.1 says this, Therefore, 
as a prisoner serving the Lord, I beg you, this is Paul in chains. He says, I beg you, I beg you, I beg you, live a life worthy of the call. And I want to challenge you. There's so many people going through this life and they're, they're content to just have a house and a car and, you know, a nice family. And the Lord's saying, do something worthy of the call that I have over your life. Do something of value. John 10, 10 says, I've come that you have life and life to the full. That God has intended our lives to yield fruit, to do something of significance. That God's calling over our lives. Philippians 1, 6 says this, being confident in this, that he who began in a good work in you, he's going to carry it through the yes. day of completion. Yes. That God actually has a plan for your life. Yes. So I want to give you a couple of things if we're going to make the moves God's called us to make, if we're going to step out in the moves that God's called us to make in our lives from the story of Gideon. First one is this. Number one is the least become leaders in God's kingdom. Here's Gideon. And Gideon thinks, I am the weakest of the weak of the weak of the weak. And God says, perfect. You're the dude I want to use. Yeah. And some of you have said to God, God, how can you ever use me? And you've, you've filled in the blanks as to why God can't. Well, my bank account's not big enough. My skill set's not enough. I have these restrictions. Or, or you know, I have no influence. Or I have whatever. And God says, no, 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 no. If you feel like you're least, that actually puts you in perfect position for me to use you in great ways. Some of you would say, well, you don't know my history and I've had trauma and I've, I've had experiences that are challenging. And the Lord speaks to Gideon, who's, who's got family history. Like he's considered the least in his family. He's got issues where they've been ransacked year after year by the Midianites, where there's ongoing trauma and challenges and and he's got some major issues. He's hiding out in this wine press. And the Lord says, perfect. You can become an amazing leader for yes, me. Lord. Yes, Lord. And likewise, I would say the Lord would say that to you in your life. It, no matter what you're feeling today, no matter how you're feeling, like, I can't be used. God says, I've got a plan. Yes, I've Lord. got a purpose for your life. Amen. No matter what you've experienced, 1 Corinthians 1 26 says this, for consider your calling, that not many of you are wise according to the flesh, not many of you are mighty, not many of you are noble, any noble people here today come from a noble birth, but it says God chose the foolish things of this world to shame that which is wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame that which are strong. Yes. I remember in um, my life, the first day I went to Bible college. And uh, as I said, I grew up on a little bit of a farm, but my dad had a, a lumber store. That was kind of the main industry of our household. And, and it was Beaver Lumber, if anyone remembers the old school kind of name. And, and so I grew up working at the store. And, and I remember the first day going to Bible college, and we were in this room, and it was a big, big classroom, and they had uh, everyone in there. And they, they said, okay, how many people uh, are, they come from, uh, your parents are in ministry, and like, half the class basically and I was like oh my goodness and they started to go through each person and all their connections and they stand up and then they stood on the side of the room and then they talked about how many people are gifted in music and if you know me I can't clap on me to save my life and I have zero musical ability and I'm like well that's not me and and then they started to go through all these different giftings who's led that the and I'm like I'm like hmm this is not me and they finally get down there's like Three of us left, and there's 300 on this side of the room, and three of us left, and I started to think, man, do I belong here? <laughs> like, they've gone through, like, the cream of the crop and the best of the best, and, and then they're getting through, and, like, I'm over here with the numbskulls over here. <laughs> and I'm like, Lord, is that, is that what you're calling me? Like, Lord, seriously? And I remember the Lord just speaking in, I've called you, Jay. Some of you, you've had a number of reasons why God can't use. You've had a number of reasons why uh, this can't be me, or how could I ever be used? I was with a pastor just the other day, and, and he's got quite a story. He grew up, and he, he, was the, he was the kid that got picked on by everybody, and, and so then he decided to become 
you know, the bully, and so he became like the strong guy that would 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 fight back, and he became a miner, like a pretty tough, hardcore job, and 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 he 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 just he. He felt like God saying, I want to use you. And he thought there's no possible way. And he went through his life for a long time. And anyways, long story short, he's now a pastor working with kids. Jesus. And seeing lives transformed and changed. Amen. And he's like, I never thought any of this was possible. This week I was on a Zoom call with one of our pastors. He's Nepali and planted this amazing church in Waterloo. And his story, he's actually in Nepali. He, him and I had a Zoom call this week because his wife is in a hospital in Nepal. That's a whole other story. But, but um, he grew up as a Bhutanese guy, and his parents fled in the middle of the night, and they were in a refugee camp in Nepal. And for 15 years, they're in this refugee camp, and he has no money and no, no ability, never been to school, and no access to education, no access, barely getting by to eat. And, and this pastor keeps sharing his story with them, and he comes to Jesus. Amen. And he thought, how am I ever going to be used by God? And now, as he's leading this Bible college, and he's leading this international ministry, he's like, I never thought my life would go here. Mm. This week he was leading a, a meeting with Nepalis, where it's still illegal to convert people to Christianity. And he led hundreds of people to Jesus. There was 1,500 people show up on a mountain hillside area in Nepal, wow. just outside of Kathmandu. He's like, How, who would have ever thought God would use me? I don't know about your life, but I believe that God chooses. See this little pond. Uh, I asked my wife to give me a king in a pond, but she got me a bishop in a pond. That's good. This little pawn is like thought to be the weakest of the, of, the, of the moves. But yet when it gets to the end, it becomes the most powerful uh, piece on the board. Yeah. Likewise, God calls us as we trust in him. Amen. The least become the leaders when you choose to trust God. Oh, yes. And God has a plan for your life. Secondly, I, I, I think in our lives that the little becomes lots. The least become leaders, but then the little becomes lost. Here's the Lord. He says, okay, Gideon, you got too many men. Like, if you do it now, you're just going to think it's because our soldiers are so great. I'm going to get that so that you know beyond no that it was my miracle. Yes, Lord. And I believe in our lives that God's calling us to trust him with our little. Yes, Lord. And some of you are saying, well, God, how can you use me? I'm just... God, I don't, I don't have a big bank account. There, there was prayers in this morning for finances. I get that. Lord, how can you use me? My wife and I remember our first pastorate job. We were in Northern Ontario. We made $13,000 a year. Actually, it was $13,500 a year. It was some pretty lean living for the two of us. God, how can you use me? And God chooses to do miracles. Oh, yes, yes. Amen. And God chooses to multiply. And God chooses to take the little things and become great when we trust him in this. We're a movement of people that always believe the little becomes lots in God's hands. When we started, the, our, our roots as the Pentecostal Assemblies, we started with this, with this preacher. His name is William Seymour, if you know our history yeah. at all. Yeah. And, and he was a, a son of a slave. He was a black guy in a very racially charged United States at this time. He wasn't even actually permitted to go to school because, uh, because of his race. And so he, he sat on the outside of the church listening into the education through the window like crazy. And he assembled this group, this little group of people, and they believed they could change the world. And guess what? They did. Yes. And likewise, I think in our lives, God takes the little things and when we trust him, oh, yes. it becomes lots in his hands. He does miracles. I was with one of our pastors, his name is James, and, and this church during COVID, they, they, they lost their meeting space, their rented space, and lost it during COVID like many, many churches. And, and so they were like, what are we going to do? And they were praying, and, and they said, the Lord really put it on our hearts that we, 
we're believing for a, a building. And they're in Mississauga. They were a young church plant, only a handful of years old. And, and I was like, oh, wow, that's going to be tough in Mississauga. Like, the land is expensive there. And he said, so how much do you think we need to, to get a space? And I said, well, you're going to need at least $300,000 down payment. And he was like, oh. And I said, how much do you guys have? And they'd saved about $3,700. And he's like, that's going to be impossible. <laughs> he said, like, we're just a congregation of not wealthy people at all. And he's like, how are we going to raise $300,000? We have, we have just, like, they have about the same number as this church here. And he's like, how are we going to do it? So I said, well, I don't know, but God can do miracles. Yeah. So, so they just started praying, and they were believing God. And they were trusting God. And, and so then James called me and said, Pastor, 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 you'll never guess. He said they had the online broadcast like you guys are doing. He said, somebody watched our broadcast and they, they called us and they've never been to our church and they want to give us a hundred and I think it was 120,000 US dollars. And I was like, mm, is this like a Nigerian prince somewhere that sends the emails that you get, you know what I mean? Send your social insurance number. And I'll get, no, don't do that. And so I was like, I'm not sure. And so I'm trying not to, but... But he's like, Pastor, God's doing a miracle. I was like, okay, well, let's see. And anyways, it turns out it was legit. We were able to get the money. In, and God just did this miracle, hundred some thousand U.S. dollars. And you turn that into Canadian, it's like a zillion, you know. And, <laughs> and then we were able to, I said, well, we're not quite there yet. And so, so they were praying. And then another person just completely, God just brought these miracles. Yeah. And we were able to dedicate their building and they just, they knew God did the miracle. Least becomes lots when you trust in God. Whatever you have today, it's enough for God to do the miracle. You might feel like it's a little barley crumb. You might feel like it's a little tiny barley crumb like this story. But God says, it's enough for me. I can do miracles. I can change anything if you just trust me with your moves. Lee become leaders, little becomes lots. And then finally this morning, our leap becomes our liberty. God told Gideon, okay Gideon, this is all on you taking action. Gideon, you have to step out. Gideon, you, you can't just say, okay, I trust you Lord, but do nothing with it. You actually have to make a move, Gideon. Yes. And here's Gideon, in the middle of the night, okay, we've got 300 soldiers, 130,000. Okay, Lord, we're gonna do it. Here he is in the wine press. God, I'm the least of the least of the least. Okay, you're calling me. I'm gonna step out and make a move. And I don't know your life what God's calling you to make a move, but some of you, it, it's difficult to make that first move, isn't it? It's tricky to make that first move. I, I remember back a number of years ago, I was thinking about this this week because his, his wife, it was last week, she actually sent me um, the picture of it, and it was the day we were there. And so about, this is like 15 years ago, maybe a little bit longer. And I was with a, a guy, and his name is David Hazard. And he, at that time, he was the assistant superintendent of POC. And I'm this young pastor, youngish pastor. And, and we go, uh, we were up at, preaching at this camp, and one of our camps. And, and uh, we went on the afternoon. He said, I hear there's some cliffs you can jump off of. He's like, could you take me there? So I'm like, sure. So we went to this lake called Martyr Lake. And it's a beautiful day. And, you know, kind of a gentle breeze blowing midsummer, like, mid-July, just one of those beautiful days, and we go hiking up the side of the lake, and, and there's spots where someone, which I don't condone, but it was there, so it was good that it was there, they'd like spray paint it into the rock, like, okay, 15 foot, this is a good spot to jump, and they, they even spray painted lines, like where you're supposed to jump, and you're like, okay, and then you went up to another one, and it was like 22 feet, and then another one, 20, I think it was 27, and then they had a 33, and then the, the top one was this this 40, uh, I think it was 47 feet. And you get up there and you're like, 
And I don't know about you, maybe that's not much, but for me, it's like, oh, that's a long ways. <laughs> and it's just this beautiful day, and, and Dave Hazard, he's uh, quite a bit older than me, and, and he's like, come on, Jay, let's do it, you go. And I'm like, oh, you go first. Like, <laughs> you know, I want the elders to go first. And, and so he gets out there, and he, poof, he goes off, and he's into the water, and I'm like, oh, he actually did it. <laughs> no, I couldn't do it. And he's in the water, and he's chirping me from the water. You know? He's like, come on, go check it out. And there's a couple other people with us. And so this guy, Sam, he's with us. And he goes off. And, and then there was another, uh, this, this younger girl. And I was like, wow, she, ah, she did it too. And they're all four of them now are chirping me. And I'm, I'm on the edge. And, I, you know, like the toes are on the edge. And I'm like, I'm literally that far away from jumping off, right? In every like minute that went by, it got ten feet taller sometimes. It was like it just all of a sudden, you know, the the paralysis kind of just made it more scary, you know? I don't know if you've ever kind of been there, and then you're starting to like start messing with your head. You know, like, come on, you can do this. It's one step. Come on, Jay, do this. Some of you, God's told to make a move. And for whatever reason, and the reasons could be many, maybe it's a fear of lack of resources, maybe it's a feeling like I, I'm not significant enough or I don't have enough strength, or, or maybe that the, it just seems improbable or this is too scary, I, I can't do it. And the Lord's calling you to take a leap and, and maybe for whatever reason it's been tough and you've sat there and like paralysis has come over you. I want to challenge you to step out this year. To make the move God's calling you to make. To, to take that, I always say to my kids, take 15 seconds of courage. You know what I mean? It's usually all of those fears are paper thin. You just got to break through and say, okay, God, I'm going to trust for this next move. One of the things I do now is every week I, I, I measure how many times during the week that I have to step out. And, and get out of my comfort zone and trust God for something. Oh, yeah. How many courageous steps did I have to take? If I get through the week and I haven't had to take any, then I, I question if I've really been in step with the Spirit of God that week. Jesus. What's God calling you to step out in this week? What's God calling you to, to trust Him? I was with this uh, great couple, Jeff and Jen, and I, I was preaching in their church just like this a few years ago, and, and at the end of the service, they came to me and they said, Pastor, you were talking about... Uh, trusting God over our lives and the call of God over our lives. And, and they said, we, we feel like God's calling us to step out into pastoral work, but, but we have careers and we, we've never done anything like that. And I said, well, great, go for it. And we worked with them. And long story short, they stepped out of good government jobs to start a church on a university campus. And God has just blessed it. Now they're on three different campuses. The university said that they were, it is actually the secular clubs of the camp, which this is a university, which is the most, you know, liberal against faith kind of, and they said that they were the biggest change makers in the whole school. They gave them an award. How cool is that? If you just trust God, incredible things happen. What's the call God's calling you to step out of? Maybe you feel like the pawn this morning, just insignificant. God says, trust me. Amen. Trust me in this. If you'll just trust me with a step, I'll do incredible things through your life. Oh, yes. The least become leaders. The little becomes lots. That leap becomes your liberty if you'll just trust in him today. What's the move God's calling you to make? Can we pray? Mighty God, we just come to you this morning. Lord. God, I say thank you for Forest Church, Lord. I say thank you for Pastor Steve and Mary. We bless them today. God, they, I just say thank you for their lives and how they've served you and, Lord, their leadership. And, Lord, I just speak blessing on them as they're on holidays, Lord, that you would refresh them, renew them. Lord, I say thank you for this church, Lord, for the for, for all that serve worship area and the kids. 
Lord, to every aspect. Lord, today I speak blessing over this house. Lord, I pray for each one in this house today, Lord, that God, they would sense and they would feel you calling them, Lord, to whatever you're calling them to step out.